I'm going to pass the mic to Malcolm. But first, uh, because uh, of the theme, we thought it would be nice if the introduction wasn't made really by Malcolm introducing himself, but by someone else. So um, we had Mark Bailey, who's a creative director at Blonde, uh, write a little uh, introduction. So I'm going to read it to you, if that's OK. So they met um, in uni in the Strathclyde um, Virtual Environments Department. And this is what uh, Mark has to say about Malcolm. <laughs> um, I knew that Malcolm played music, but one day he came into work and gave each of us a copy of his new album, Jazz Readers Volume 1, and acted like that was totally normal and okay. It started us saying things like, where's Malcolm? Oh, he's off to Russia as a guest of the state to conduct the Royal Orchestra, obviously. What was it like? He said it was hard to find fruit. We weren't allowed to talk about Deacon Blue much, which of course he was a part of setting up. Uh, and when I asked him about doing this talk, this creative morning talk, well obviously he was in the middle of writing an opera. The only time I've actually seen him close to boasting is when he makes a minor profit on eBay by buying old watches and selling them on again for an extra quid. That's a happy man right there. <laughs> Ironically for someone with, with such humility, he has a giant head that no hat on earth will fit. <laughs> I think that's mostly hair and genetics, not ego. <laughs> right, so pass it on to Malcolm. Thanks very much for the, the introduction, and thanks, Mark, for these uh, really lovely thoughts. Um, let me just set up, and then we'll get going. Um, so it's great to to um, be in Edinburgh. Thanks for the chance and um, to be part of this really exciting and uh, worthwhile movement, um, which is Creative Mornings. Uh, not just that, the chance to get out of my studio in Glasgow and travel to one of my favourite European uh, cities. I've come on here and holiday in recent years, believe it or not. Um, I told my friend Ian Smith. Um, about what I was going to be doing today, travelling to Edinburgh, speaking. And Ian might have come along, but instead um, he's done some drawings to uh, help us uh, focus our minds during this uh, session. Um, I'm just going to skip through the first three and we'll maybe come back to them later. Uh, and this is the, the, the key drawing as a kind of introduction that Ian thought might uh, help in terms of the, the theme. I love his uh, West is Best t-shirt. Tremendous stuff. Uh, and I hope you can translate the Glaswegian as well. So when we come back to some of the issues this, uh, this image raises, much of what I do uh, is in the role of TV and film composer. So I want to begin by letting you see just a two minute uh, film clip. And this is from a drama series that I scored a few years ago. It's not my, my latest uh, work or, or, or uh, anything like that. And I realise it's quite hard hitting uh, for this time on a Friday morning. Uh, but believe me, it's one of the least hard hitting clips I could extract from my collection. Um, <clears throat> so let me just set this up. And um, we're presenting today in glorious uh, mono sound, you'll be glad to know, old, old school stuff. And apologies for the language as well. You tell that fat bastard, if he comes anywhere near me, he's gonna get his brains splattered. Have you got a gun, Ruth? You tell me you've got a gun. Well, there are no flies on you, other. Jesus Christ. And the first person that walks in here, they're gonna get blasted into the middle of next week. And me personally, I am hoping it's him. Believe you me, nothing would give me greater pleasure. And do you know why? Just...
جميلك interference during that. Um, so sorry about that. Um, now, I'm expecting there's maybe a few of you um, didn't really notice the music or at least a few that couldn't describe it in any significant way. And, and that is because music is meant to be invisible. It should contribute to um, supporting the drama as the drama unfolds, uh, but no more. I think it's, it's worth pointing out that the creation of the, the, the score in, in that case involved a huge deal of painstaking collaboration, which is something that I happen to enjoy. And creating TV uh, drama series, a film, can be one of the most interesting and complex examples of collaboration in action, where the whole um, exceeds the contribution of any uh, one person or part on every level. Now, the theme's humility, as you know, and one aspect of humility, or being humble, I think, is to respect the judgement and the talent and the skills of other people. Fairly basic stuff. Um, and it's relevant to us here, um, in that if we're going to work with each other, or with clients, and be successful in the long term, um, then I would suggest that we need to be humble, or at least reach a state of humility. Um, <clears throat> humility is also about being open and being ready to accept ideas and the advice, the suggestions from others. So if you're not in this state of mind, um, then it's very hard to succeed, particularly uh, in the area that I work, the film industry, um, since I'd be swimming against a very strong tide. Overall, my experience of the industry has been good. I've worked with a few different directors and teams and it's those kind of collaborations and interactions that I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about um, this morning. Um, but before that, um, a quick introduction to uh, myself can be found um, at my website. So that's a useful reference that um, you might want to follow up. And um, here you can find out about the kind of um, uh, soundtrack work I do. So it's the for film and TV but also um, orchestral scores, um, working with orchestras and uh, Americana and jazz and doing some work with theatre and radio. So there's a variety of music and activities um, that uh, make up uh, my, my day job, if you like. Um, and um, this is my kind of tagline, if you like, my brand, mini brand. Music that moves. Um, <clears throat> so I've just, although I've just mentioned these different styles of music, I believe they're all connected through um, emotion. Um, I like music that, that moves me in some way. Uh, so I try and write music that, that moves or may move other people. Uh, so it's very simple. And um, I try and I make music that's, that's perhaps direct and pure and emotional. Uh, those are my taglines. Um, my background is fairly um, 
Oh, I've got an agent in London, that's all that is. Um, my background's fairly um, rich in experience, but without much training. So I was taught music in a convent in the, the, the north of, of Scotland. And their sister, Mary Winifred, I just found this photograph of her recently. <coughs> uh, you can never tell if that's a smile or an evil look on <laughs> his sister's face. And I know for a fact she has a ruler wrapped up in that bit of music she's holding. <laughs> I've been there. Um, and I was, to be truthful, not very good at piano. And the reason I was kept on was because I had quite a good voice. My parents knew this, but I didn't. And I went on to sing um, in a little opera. That's me at the front of the plus fours. <laughs> um, so it's just interesting because um, it, we're putting on, on this opera in the, in the north of Scotland and uh, Peter Pierce and Benjamin Britten, the people that wrote it, actually came to, to see it performed. So that was a, a remarkable bit of, um, I don't know what it is. I don't know why they were there, st st still don't know. But uh, Benjamin Britten, the great composer. Um, was there for some reason. Um, <clears throat> by 1981, uh, I'd been touring around with a band for four years and John Peel had played our new wave single on Radio 1. So I was just in heaven. And this is my comrade uh, group here, um, the band at the time. Um, and I mean, interestingly, it, it, you know, out of this lot, there's two professors, uh, a minister, a missionary and a university chancellor. And me, so I'm the only one without a responsible job. Mm -hmm. um, but an interesting set of people. And you can actually buy the single still uh, on eBay for about 100 quid. And I've got about 10, in the, 10 of them in the loft. Um, so we'll be revisiting that at some point. So jump forward from those, those early days um, to now when I've just released a classical album with the, the RSNO, the National Orchestra. It's been um, quite a journey. Uh, and I'm still, I'm still kind of travelling been very exciting. And the reason I got there, uh, there's lots of reasons, but uh, one aspect that I'm sure had an influence was that I was completely dedicated to music uh, for a good number of, of years. Um, endless hours spent learning, or rehearsing, or practicing. Um, so music's the kind of um, key um, but also, um, creativity has been very important in the way I've approached life. Uh, not just in relation to music, but uh, other areas as well. I've seen a revolution of change brought on by digital technology across these areas. And the, adv the advent of digitally driven cultures that we are grappling with today. Um, and that most of you are probably earning a living through. I'm still grappling with my presentation, which seems to have momentarily stopped. Let me just... Okay. I thought I'd go old school and use a, um, an XP machine today. So. so back to um, subject in hand, humility, collaboration, writing music for film. Without the, the, the qualities of humility, there's a danger that collaboration can just co co career off the rails. If you don't have respect for those that you're working for, it can be real trouble. This is real basic stuff in terms of uh, the elements that make up a good collaboration. It's something I might show to, to students. Um, you guys probably all, all are aware of this. Um, the key one for me is to be part of a solution. You know, if you're reporting back to your team that you're working with, with some problem, at least take a solution with you on the way. Uh, that, that's going to help. Um, so, two aspects that I find are, are very important. Um, first is the director is always right. It's just one man or a, a woman with a vision. And you think, well, hang on, that's not very really modern. There's no flip charts there or cosy huddles where we discuss the way ahead. It's just somebody in charge. So that's, that's I think that's an interesting thing. It's a bit like the army uh, and a bit of works. Um, also music is emotionally charged and that suggests that creating a soundtrack is not going to be easy um, because 
everyone's going to have a different response to the music. It makes it a complex job. But the payoff is that if it works, it can make a powerful contribution to the film that you're working on. Oh, reboot. <laughs> um, let me just go on and see where that takes us. Um, I, can, I can deal with it while we're, I'm talking. So how do I um, get into a film and write a score? The key thing is to find the heartbeat of that film. Um, I'll look at a film and I'll sense a rhythm coming from it. Um, when the editor is, is, is kind of editing the footage, they will sense some kind of rhythm in the acting and the script, and that will come through. Or I'll create a pulse that merges into the frame or the footage. Um, and for me, it's almost like if I can nail the opening of a film, then the rest falls into place. It's like finding a kind of key, magic key to a door, which can help uh, discover um, and uncover uh, the sonic world that is just waiting uh, for me. So, in a sense, it's a bit strange because um, this is almost as if the film takes over the, the creative process at that point and I'm just walking into a sonic world. So how do I work with the director? Um, I enter a dialogue. It's as simple as that. Um, and in this case, um, um, I suppose I'm being fed lots of different ideas. It might just be a word cloud. And in that word cloud, we're getting things, uh, 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 references to the characters in the film, to uh, maybe a music reference. Um, it could be emotions. Um, and I can maybe let you see that when the machine's back up properly. Um, okay, so then you've had that discussion. What am I going to write? So you, you, you kind of, I come up with some ideas and then I will pass those ideas onto the, the director and the editor and they'll look at them and they'll give me some response. So it's fairly straightforward. And then that will happen again. I will refine that idea. So what just happened? I've entered into a creative feedback loop. So um, in a sense, what I've, I've, d I've described there um, is a simple design process. So I'm suggesting that I'm not actually writing music. I'm designing music. So you think, well, hang on, how, how can you say that? How can you say you're designing music? How, how does that work? Um, and it's because when you, um, when you go to write a bit of music, if you're a composer from scratch, you, you've got to think, right, what emotion am I going to put into it? What instrumentation? What timing? Uh, the length of it? And, and so forth. Um, but when I step up to write a bit of music for film, um, that's already there. All these pieces are there. So all I'm doing is kind of arriving late in the game and writing a, designing a little thing to go in there. So that's why um, I can um, write music fast because you're not starting from scratch. It's kind of all laid out before you. Um, another example, just to to get things off. I'm going to just start this and see if it runs. <clears throat> the joys of old school technology. It's almost analogue, this computer. It's so old. But I love recycling, so I can't bear to throw it away. It's never crashed before. Sure you've had that. Um, <clears throat> so, an example of... Um, another example was that this week... Um, it was great because we had a premiere in the Tribeca Festival in New York. And um, I must say, I had to look up where the festival was. I didn't know. And the website doesn't even say it because they just assume everyone knows that mm -hmm. Tribeca is a part. It's like the Edinburgh International Festival. Everyone knows where that is. Anyway, so we had a, um, a, a film opening there, premiering there this week. It just finished yesterday. Um, it's a very powerful film. It's got very evocative moments. The director wanted the score never to resolve. 
So I thought he was talking generally. Um, but this idea actually translated into musical notation. So much so that um, he was, uh, he and I were very obsessive in, in a good way. Um, and his point was that if, if we allowed that music to resolve, then it'd be making a very strong statement. We'd be telling the audience what to think in this documentary. Uh, and in this case, the role of the music was to, to sustain the tension in the story. Um, that was all. Also, I was listening back to some of the score that we created, and um, I thought, wow, wow, where did that come from? I didn't, didn't recognise it. You know, you just dip in and listen to it, and you woof. So there was a real kind of um, struggle, in a good way, to get something uh, different uh, happening. Also, on the, the, the kind of technical side, which some of you might be interested in, um, I didn't deliver a stereo soundtrack um, at the end, a stereo pair uh, to the, the dubbing studio where it's all mixed together. I gave them five layers of stereo tracks. <clears throat> um, so that is like, if you're a Photoshop person, that's like you handing over all your layers in Photoshop to a client. Um, <clears throat> so the, the director, the, the, the mixing guys, they can use that in any way they want. Most of the time they'll just stick to what's written, but if there's a problem, they'll go in. <coughs> Bless you. But, um, so that, that kind of delivery challenges, I think, um, one's role as a creative, you know, if you think about that for a little while. It's about letting go, and it's about remembering, hey, I get paid for this anyway. What's the problem? You know, if, if the client wants to mess about, that's fine. Um, and when there's a client involved, it's usually not about art, it's about design. Which gets back to my other point. Um, <clears throat> let me just see if this works. Um, okay, I I kind of turned full time composer about ten years ago. Before that, I had various day jobs. Um, and. Uh, so I was working for, um, I was a, a software scientist for about 25 years, and then a researcher. Um, I was a specialist in software for the MOD. I worked for the University of Strathclyde, um, researching new technologies. I ran the first uh, of the UK's virtual environment labs, um, which was, was great. It, was, it wasn't like having a job at all. And during that period, I was greatly influenced by a couple of people. Um, who were, you know, they, they were of genius standing, uh, but they were humility in action. And um, they always had time to support the staff, encourage uh, joint adventures um, into new areas, and they always had time to, um, I don't know, just, just, to, just to feel, make you feel relaxed in what you were doing and, and supporting you rather than directing you. So that was, um, that, that's had a big influence on uh, where I've gone in life. So um, back to the music, I've been involved in a number of um, collaborative uh, art music projects um, and many have involved setting goals um, and th this might be the most in or the more interesting thing I've got to say today. <laughs> um, during that time I've come up with an approach which may seem a little against the principles of humility, um, especially in our kind of Scottish culture and all that comes with it. Um, but my, my kind of look on it is to aim for the, the top, the very top, set your ambitions very high. And humility and high ambitions, I think, are completely compatible. Um, so why aim for the top? I just think there's a better route involved. Um, you can find your level more easily. You know, if you go at the top, you might come down a little bit. Everything's okay. If you start at the bottom, you know exactly where you're going, but it could take ages to get there. So it's a slightly different, maybe just a conceptual thing. And a couple of examples of, of, um, of that. And the first one that blew my mind was when I was just starting out um, as a, a musician composer, I was having these ideas for string quartets and had a keyboard that could remember the ideas for me. So I could play back a string quartet that I'd written. I think, oh, that sounds interesting. 
I thought, who's the who are going to be best in Scotland? <laughs> uh, uh, you know, at at helping me to to realise this, giving me some advice. I thought Scottish Chamber Orchestra. So I got in touch with them and explained that I was, you know, had these ideas, vague ideas about string quartet, and I've I've written a few of them. And um, you know, wh what what could I do next? Um, I had a performance coming up, and and um, they, and they said, oh, we'll we'll play them for you." So it was quite a remarkable moment. And they also, you know, explained that I wasn't very good with notation. Um, and they they provided somebody to to uh, help me and to teach me, and that actually changed my life. I said, "Wow, how did that happen?" <laughs> and um, it had an impact on me. So five or five or so years later, I'd I'd written a an album of string quartet music and had it recorded which I was very proud of at the time. Um, and I thought, right, who's who's the best in the world at doing string quartet stuff? Where, where might they be? Uh, you know, dare, dare I think about that? <coughs> I thought they're probably going to be in Moscow, um, in Russia. So I made some inquiries, and um, 18 months later, I was on stage with the Moscow Contemporary Music Ensemble uh, in Moscow um, for a performance of a string quartet uh, music. So that was... Astonishing, and um, I'll give you another astonishing, <laughs> which uh, uh, was just just uh, last year. So I mean, this, this is something that I keep uh, I keep uh, you know in my psyche that if I'm going to do some well, let's let's do it properly because life is short, especially when you're my age. Um, so last year we're, I was recording this this album with the the RSNO National Orchestra, and, and relatively short uh, short notice the producer. The engineer dropped out. I was going to produce it myself, um, so we needed to get um, a producer on board the project. So we approached um, Tim Hanley. He's got five Grammys in recording. Um, so it really threw, uh, and he said yes. So it really threw all the, the pressure back on me to you know, make sure the score was going to live up to, to Tim Hanley's handling, if you like. And what's the worst that can happen? Somebody would say no, perhaps. That's all. So, um, just to kind of, um, s not to sum up, but just to, just to throw out another series of thoughts, um, I think humility is not about false modesty um, at all, but perhaps about being open to others, to each other, respecting each other, and changing ideas, exchanging ideas rather, and sharing a, a journey or a process in the hope of creating something uh, special. Those are my uh, thoughts. Um, sorry about a bit of a, a blip with the, um, the presentation, but we can maybe um, stop there and I'll take some questions rather than me going on and stuff that you might quite not uh, know. So is there any, any questions, feedback? If there isn't, I'll tell a story about Mark. <laughs> I'll do that while you're, you're thinking of your question. <laughs> not really about Mark, but uh, we had a great time in Abacus. And um, I, I was I was not always the butt of, of the jokes because I think Mark thought that I was his boss, which wasn't, you know, technically maybe, yeah, but we're all in we're all it together. But my other colleague, another senior researcher, Gary Ennis, came in one day, and he was really busy, Gary, to find his computer had been completely dismantled and all the parts of the machine laid out on a desk. Did you give him instructions of how to put it back together? No. <laughs> so that was the kind of crazy stuff that we used to get up to in Abacus. Anyway, so any questions or just reactions for, from that talk? Or you? Oh, while everyone gathers their thoughts, um, I had a question for you. Um, so you design music for films that are made. Have you ever thought of doing it the other way around and create your music and then find a director who wants to? Well, in a sense, um, yes, yeah, so just, just doing that right now. Um, we kind of came up with this mad project um, about a year, a year or so ago, where we thought that um, we'd, um, what, what if we created a sound, exactly that, what if we created a soundtrack and then, then did the film? And it's the context of Scottish opera. So um, today they're starting to shoot um, a film in Glasgow, and that, but I've already written um, about 80% of the score, and it's an operatic score. And we're going to record it at the Scottish Opera uh, at the end of May, um, so the the score will be finished before the the film is finished. So that's quite an intriguing one, um, and there's a, an interesting feedback loop has 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 kind of come into play, where um, 
we were working from the script, you know, getting some inspiration from that to, to create the opera. And then people writing the script, which is changing all the time. It's changing even this week, even though it's, it's been shot uh, today, um, starting to be shot today. They're listening to the music and going, ah, that's for that character. Let's, that's interesting. I never thought of that character as being that, that type of person, you know, based on the music and what they're hearing. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's really exciting. We've got, I think, five days to shoot the, the film, just a short film, but it's a, a window uh, onto a feature. And then hopefully um, the Scottish Opera are, are uh, uh, very supportive of the project. So there might be a, a kind of stage production uses coming of the film with a, a full performance uh, of the music. So the, I've got exactly eight weeks to write the, the whole opera and um, the CD will be out, I think, uh, at the end of June, just because it has to be, you know, because we're, we're on like a fast track. Before the film's finished, actually, the CD will be out. The soundtrack is a bit mad. Good it's question. Good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so anyone else got some questions for Malcolm? Yeah, I've got one. Um, you mentioned that you got to where you have by being completely dedicated to yeah. the music, um, but that you've also worked various day jobs. And I wondered how you managed that combination. Yeah, I think just. Um, it's a good question, and I, I think long hours is probably the answer. I mean, I had a, a day job that uh, I managed to, for most of the time, you know, keep in a little compartment. Um, and that there was a time where I had, I had effectively was skint, so I had two day jobs. You know, I was doing research <coughs> during the day and, and writing software at night, and tr still trying to fit in, fit the music in. Um, but yeah, at times you just got to. Um, make a huge effort that seems like a huge effort, you know. Um, but, uh, it, that, I mean, that, that aspect of it's paid off. I mean, I'm not one of these folks who say, well, you know, follow your dreams, because that's the thing, that's a bit, you know, make all the sacrifices for your dreams. I think that's slightly, and you'll, and you'll get there, I think that's slightly naive saying, yeah, your dreams will come true, you know. Um, but, yeah, just, just hard work, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Um, when it comes to deadlines and these things, uh, I think most people who has done some creative things at some point, you know, know that there's this lock that can happen. You know that you can't produce anything for, yeah. say, like a week or something like that. Yeah. How does that? How do you get over that? Um, get a bit depressed. <laughs> <laughs> um, but ultimately, the deadline helps. I think having the deadline there takes you out of a it, it moves you from a creative into somebody who's going to deliver something. <coughs> um, and in the film industry, <coughs> I was pretty shocked when I got my first job because um, uh, there was, I think, nine weeks. It was um, Sherlock Holmes for BBC, and there was nine weeks to write the score. And I was going, nine weeks? That's, how am I going to do a whole score in nine weeks? Um, but I can now do... A whole score in one week, if you needed, and I think it's it's about training, training your your creative side to to kick in and get stuff done. Um, you know, we're we're, uh, and I, I, it helps me because um, <clears throat> for this opera, I've got I've just got eight weeks to write the whole thing, you know, all the music, and I was pretty depressed about it um, until I thought, ah, it's a soundtrack, it's not an opera. Whew, that's okay. <laughs> I can do soundtracks. I can write them pretty fast. So I, I have actually given that. I've got one last piece to write, and I'll, I'll finish writing that um, next Wednesday at five o'clock. <laughs> Just because I have to, you know, that's it. But it's not easy. Uh, Rachel, um, when you spoke about kind of going in at the top and getting in with these, these big orchestras and that kind of thing, did you find that it was better to come at that from an angle that had this kind of sense of humility rather than trying to oversell yourself? Do you think that is a better approach? Yeah, in a way, because when I, when I approached the, the Scottish Chamber Orchestra all these years ago, um, I knew nothing about classical music. I knew what it was, and I'd obviously listened to it, and I'd, I picked up um, a, an artist called Arvo Pert, and he kind of gave me permission to write music the way that, um, that, you know, that I wanted to. Um, so that, I thought that was um, interesting. So when I, when I kind of got in touch with the Scottish Chamber Orchestra, I wasn't, I wasn't like, hey, I've, I've written this brilliant stuff. I was more like, I need some help here, can you advise me? Um, 
And it, I suppose at that point they might have said, yeah, we know some students that could, could help you out. And that would have been brilliant. You know, I wasn't looking for them. Um, but I'm impressed, impressed the way people respond if you're quite direct and um, um, friendly. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question. Ryan, did you have a question? Yeah, I was just wondering how you find kind of balancing your own kind of creative style versus like I find it quite surprising that you said you gave the actual stems to yeah. the director. Like <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't have thought that's something that you did as a as a composer, but. Um, like I can see why you do it, but I'm just wondering how you kind of balance that whole finding your own creative direction as well and your own kind of yeah. style, if you know what yeah. I mean. I mean, within the film and TV, what, what I'm, I'm there to do is I'm there to do a, a job and I kind of leave my um, my kind of uh, musical, not integrity, but, the, but my, my, my own musical um, heart, um, you know, put that aside because you're doing a specific uh job within the, the, the you know for, for them and um, but I've got all sorts of other music stuff it's just about uh, my you know my own ideas so I kind of balance the, the two um, by switching between them um, so every year I'll, tr I'll try and do a, a project um, that's it's just all about you know through the focus on music and it's about um, make myself happy <laughs> um, and then I'll do a then I'll come and do a film but that makes me happy in a different way I just, I just love the mechanics of doing it and the adventure of working with a director. It's not always smooth, um, but we're on, we're on camera, so I can't really talk about that. <laughs> but I have to talk about that later. Um. All right, well, thank you so much, Malcolm. No, thanks. Thanks,